All right. Uh, good evening, uh, Dreamforce. Uh, welcome to the uh, session OpenID uh, Connect and Single Sign-On for Beginners. All right, we will be making some, uh, if we make any forward-looking <coughs> statements, don't use it to make any purchasing decisions, the standard safe harbor that you must have seen throughout this week. All right, so I am Abhishek Shivasubramanian. I am a senior developer evangelist at Suyati Technologies, and I have more than four years of experience in uh, Salesforce customizations and integrations. A uh, few words about uh, Suyati Technologies. Uh, Suyati focuses on delivering niche IT solutions and services, uh, including CMS like Ektron, uh, you know, a CRM like Salesforce, and on e-commerce platforms. Uh, we are a Microsoft Gold partner and an Ektron featured implementation partner and a Salesforce App Exchange partner. Uh, and also, uh, we have a C, uh, the center of excellence in .NET Force and mobile app technologies. And uh, joining me is... I'm Vikas Jain. Uh, I do product management for Salesforce Identity. So um, with me also here is uh, folks from my identity uh, development team. So uh, Matt, Sidi, Thomas at the back, just show your hands to the folks here. Um, Itzi Koren is another product manager on the uh, identity authentication team. All right. <clears throat> So we move into the agenda for this session. Uh, so first of all, we'll try to um, you know, uh, familiarize ourselves with a problem around identity. Uh, it's around a fictitious company. And we'll try what's, uh, we'll first of all understand what's the problem. And then we'll try to understand what is OpenID Connect protocol. And with the knowledge of OpenID Connect protocol, we'll uh, you know, solve that problem, solve the business problem. And we'll show you the demo. And finally, we'll go into the Q and A. Right, so uh, this is the fictitious company called as uh, Universal Containers. We all are familiar with this company name, right? Uh, okay, so, so assume that this company has almost like 1,000 employees. They use three different Salesforce orgs. So one is the main business org, uh, where you have all the employees uh, in, in that business org. So you know all the management team, you know, development team, product engineering, everybody is a part of that. They use Chatter a lot in that. So, you know, huge amount of employees out there. You need uh, user management a lot there. So you have a, a separate admin team to manage those employees as well as a set of employees out there. Right. <clears throat> now, the next org that they use is something very, very specific to their product engineering department. So uh, this product engineering department, you know, basically uh, Universal Containers is a product-based company. So they have a product called as Product X. And you know you have engineers, designers who who work around innovating this product. A lot of discussion happens around that, which need not be done in the business org, which is very specific, and uh, you know particularly towards the product X. So that happens in the product engineering org. And what is the what what's interesting here is that a subset of all the employees is actually a part of the product engineering org. <coughs> Now, coming on to the application development org. Now, a company being a product-based company, you know, it's not just selling the product. You need some connectors. You know, that's, that's all around uh, integrating the products, right? So you need plugins. You need apps. So, uh, you know, there is a specialized uh, application development or team that works for universal containers that, uh, who, who create a lot of app exchange apps. Uh, they they uh, develop a lot of APIs on top of that. So the development team is there, and also because they are also a part of you know part of the um, you know all the users out there in the business org. So that you also need an admin team. So there there is a user management piece in all the orgs, right? <clears throat> now the final piece here. Product X, so you have you need to have consumers, right? So you have a lot of consumers also using the product. Now, uh, it's not just about selling the product and forgetting about it. You need feedbacks. You need a, you know, a interaction with the consumer base. The employees will be in touch with the, you know, the product uh, and, and also solving a lot of issues for the uh, consumers. So there is a product community uh, dedicated to, to, do, to those interactions where uh, all the employees as well as external users also come in, right? 
So I hope the scenario is pretty clear here. OK, so universal containers have identified a set of problems here. Now, the first problem is the administrative overload for user management. As you know, three different orgs, one product community, you know, a lot of users, a lot of reset password, change password requests, uh, requests come in. The product, the product engineering team might be using frequently their, or their own org, but not be using the, you know, the other orgs. But if they need to go in after three or four months' time, you just totally forget it. It happens to me, too. You know, you, you try out a lot of username and password combination, finally uh, lock up the whole org, and then you have to get back the admin team. So this, there's a huge amount of pain and friction going around that administration part, right? Now, when it comes to the uh, community, uh, community users, they also are not effectively coming into the community. Now, when the company conducted us, they found that you need actually four to five steps uh, to be done for a consumer to keep his first step into the community. Right? So you need the, the consumer who is first of, or the first time coming in, he needs to do a standard sign up. He needs to wait for an activation mail. God knows who when the activation mail is going to come. Right? So the activation mail comes on. You need to click that uh, link. It needs to activate. Then you need to log in. That's when you actually get into the community. And a lot of people get irritated uh, you know, doing all these steps. Uh, right? so, so there is a bit of friction there also around uh, you know, consumers seamlessly coming into the uh, community. So that socializing factor is also missing. You do not know which user is a fake user. You, know, you do not know. You, uh, you're not able to map a particular user in the community with a Facebook user. You see the same guy in Facebook. You see the same guy in LinkedIn. You see the same guy in Twitter. You're not, not able to make it out. You just have the details that you have collected through the standard sign-up process. Right? So there is a friction there uh, in that second point. The third point is around employee productivity getting reduced. Now, as employees moving around different orgs, you have different username and password combinations uh, for the same user to access different orgs. So they tend to forget username and passwords. Now, uh, you know, then to get into those orgs, they have to you know, take time to recollect, uh, you know, do a lot of access, and then get back to the administration team. A lot of you know, to and fro's happen there. So you are, the employee is also losing a lot of valuable time there. OK, so what is Universal Containers uh, thinking about solving this problem? Now, the solution for the administrative overload, what they think is they want to see some kind of feature uh, from, with which you, they can manage the user identity checks from one enterprise org, from one org. I should be able to control the users on other orgs too. You know, if a new employee is coming in, just provision him in the first org, it gets on to the two other orgs or the other applications on the enterprise. If he is leaving the company, you know, you shut this person out in the main org, it, it you know, denies access to all the orgs. So it, it should be relatively easy to manage that, right? So uh, the company is looking for some kind of feature on that. Now, for the community users to uh, seamlessly enter into the product test community, they are looking at something called, you know, something I call that as Salesforce success community phenomenon. You know, uh, we all, how many of you guys use success, Salesforce success community? Yeah, a lot of people, right? So you can use any Salesforce username and password to get into the community, right? So you don't need to do a lot of standard sign up, no activation mails, and nothing like that of that sort. So company is also looking for something of that sort, you know, a Salesforce uh, single sign-on kind of uh, feature. When it comes to the third point around, uh, you know, employee productivity getting reduced, how do we, uh, you know, make those employees get easily, you know, faster into into all the orgs? They want to have something called a single sign-on. You know, a lot of people have heard of single sign-on. We need to have something enabled in our enterprise, okay? And a, through enabling single sign-on, the employee just has to remember one username and password. That's his master enterprise username and password, right? So that's really going to boost things up. Cool. So one thing is for sure, we have to get universal containers on the single sign-on board, right? Now, remember, in the agenda, we just talked about something called as OpenID Connect. Now, uh, because 
tell us what what is open id connect okay let me first ask how many of you here know open id connect as a protocol and the inner workings okay um how many of you know saml all right so think of a one liner for open id connect is it's a modern protocol similar to saml saml is based on xml open id connect is based on json right that's the very high level overview now if you go into the protocol stack itself it rides on the oauth protocol if you are developing a mob mobile application you are actually using oauth right salesforce one application on your mobile device is using oauth so there is the oauth protocol is getting used behind the scenes for all of you that you don't know for the identity single sign on authentication the open id connect rides on top of oauth protocol the most important part of it that you have to worry about in this is the minimalistic implementation called basic client profile which is what salesforce supports you don't have to worry about discovery and dynamic client registration etc so that's at the high level the protocol now let's look at the different exchanges that happen in this protocol you have three different actors you have the client in this case it's salesforce acting as a uh, well um the client could be salesforce or any other application that is trying to um log in the end user and the auth uh, authorization server in this case for example it would be salesforce right so think of it as you putting a login with salesforce button on your website the your website is a client author, authorization server is salesforce so when a user um goes to your client application clicks on the login button they get redirected um with an authorization request to the salesforce authorization server you can always flip it and say well instead of salesforce being an authorization server it could be google or paypal being an authorization server and salesforce is a client we are talking about all the exchanges that work here right so when the authorization request is received by the authorization server you typically go with the oauth code flow and you pass in a client id as well as a redirect uri where you want finally the user to land up at and some state now before the authorization server does anything it need to authenticate the user how the user is authenticated is none of the business of the protocol it's all outside of the protocol so you can do strong authentication basic authentication authentication via some other idp like saml idp doesn't matter that's outside of the um, scope of the protocol now once the authorization server authenticates the user in whatever way it then redirects the use uh, the user to the client using and uh, it sends a code with it right this is called because it's called a code flow the authorization code is sent back to the client application what client application then has to do is hit a token endpoint on the salesforce or whatever is your authorization server and you will see that there is a grand type of uh, authorization code it has to pass in a client id secret this is the standard oauth flow um that you sent across now what you will notice is in the response the token response that is received back by the client you see the standard oauth um attributes like id instance url issue that etc the most important one is the id underscore token that is specific to the open id connect protocol this is very similar to the saml token in saml token you have this all these attributes as xml in the id underscore token you have three parts the first three characters are the header after that you have dot 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 then you have a body and then there is a dot then you have a signature after that so those are the three parts if you base 64 decode the body the middle part what you get is this structure it's a json structure and it has attributes such as 
when this token expires, which is the first expiry, what is the subject? This is the fully qualified link to a user. What Salesforce provides is, it's basically your user ID link, right? So it has um, slash org ID slash user ID. Audience is um, the, we populate it with the consumer key. So before you um, go through this protocol, you have to create a connected app, and in the connected app, you have a consumer key. The audience is the consumer key. The reason it's there in the protocol is so that it cannot be replayed by another client. So it ties the client with this. And then you have the issuer and the issued at. Issuer and the issued at. Okay. Now, what you got back in the token response was not only the ID token, you also got the um, OAuth token, right? So if I quickly go back, there is the access underscore token. This is the OAuth token apart from the ID token. So for example, if I need more information about the user that is not available in the ID token, then I can hit a user info endpoint, which is also something specific to the OpenID Connect protocol. Now, when I hit that user info endpoint, then I am passing in my um, OAuth token, and what I get back is this full structure of the user. So I get more details about the user. Anything that you have on the user record is available. Custom attributes, all the standard attributes about the user, as well as other URLs that you can hit, such as you know, the chatter URL to get all the um, friends list, et cetera. So that's the inner workings of the protocol and the flow. What does Salesforce support? Salesforce support both the client implementation and the server-side implementation. So if you look at Open ID, Salesforce as an OpenID Connect client, think of it as I'm logging into Salesforce using some third-party provider like Google, PayPal, Amazon, et cetera. All of these are OpenID Connect providers, right? So it's good for your community use cases where you want to do sign in with Google, sign in with PayPal, sign in with Amazon. Link, we also support other social sign on providers like Facebook, but they are not strictly OpenID Connect providers, so we have done some special um, custom stuff with them. Now, <clears throat> you can always do the just in time provisioning, very similar to SAML, right? So you have a reg, reg handler in your registration handler in your auth providers configuration in Salesforce where you can define how you want to provision this user who comes in for the first time using this third-party authentication, as well as do perform account linking. So let's say you already have some users in Salesforce, and instead of using user password, they now come in via uh, PayPal or Amazon. How do I? link them automatically so I don't have to create a new user ID, but their existing user ID is linked with this PayPal ID, right? Okay, as a provider, think of it as login with Salesforce. So you have a website or you want everyone who is logging into their Dreamforce application or success portal, um, success.salesforce is using us as an um, authorization provider or OpenID Connect provider, right? And so here, what is required is you use the connected apps infrastructure, Salesforce is acting as an identity provider, and then you can also put some enterprise-grade policies on top of it, like authorization policies, who can access it. In connected apps, you define profiles and permissions set. Only those set of users can access this uh, particular login mechanism. Or you can define um, refresh token decay policies like how long before we, they have to again log in into a particular application and so forth. Okay, so Abhishek, why don't you show in action how these two concepts uh, are played out? Yes, so, so we understood what is OpenID Connect because just explained it so well. Now let's come back to that universal containers. We had a problem, right? So let's try to put the puzzle and see what can we do with this OpenID Connect. 
So what we'll try to do here is we'll try to use OpenID Connect for social sign-on into Salesforce with Google. So here, the Salesforce is going to be the relying party, and the Google is going to be the IDP, that is the uh, identity provider or the authorization server, right? And also we look into the, you know, the, the reverse case, that is the OpenID Connect, uh, Salesforce has an OpenID Connect provider. So we'll do Salesforce login into the community, right? So we are going to basically use Salesforce credentials to login into a product community, right? So let's move into the demo parts, right? Now, we, one more thing I just want to reiterate here. We talked about OAuth, we talked about a lot of IDs, tokens, this thing, that thing flying around here and there. You know, you know most of the people think that this is too complex. Now, this is not too complex. This is very simple. You know, when, when I started it off, you know, I thought this is something really scary. You know, it's just six steps. You, know, you can just easily do this. So uh, let me just take you through the steps. Uh, first thing is whenever you get into the single sign on board on Salesforce, uh, my domain has to be set in the org. Right? So you should not have this ap1.salesforce.com or na2. You know, that generic one but have a customized domain name uh, set for your org. Then we'll uh, come and uh, actually configure an OpenID Connect authorization provider, and we'll tell that authorization provider that, hey, when you do the authorization request and um, you know, the authorization part, you ping Google and do that, right? Then uh, he talked about account linking, right? How do we know something, some details of the user that is coming back is related to a particular user record in Salesforce? we need to actually link it up, right? So we'll use a Google plus user ID custom field on the user record, uh, which will um, you know, be used for the account linking purpose. And we'll update that user record with a valid user, um, I mean, Google, user, uh, Google plus user ID. And finally, uh, you need some button on the, you know, the login screen, which says login with Google, right? So we'll just place that button out there, then the demo just starts, right? Cool. All right, so, so this is my uh, main org, and I will just, hold on, let me just. So what I'm trying to do here is log in into the main IDP and show you what all those implementation steps were. Okay, so the first step was to set a my domain. So search for my domain, go here to my domain, and here I have already set a my domain. So once you have set a customized domain, it should look like this. It looks very crappy here because I use a developer edition org. If it's a nice enterprise org, it'll look so nice, right? So that's a, a domain uh, set here. Now we need to set a authorization provider that points to Google. Right? So search for auth, and you'll get an auth provider here. And uh, it's, it's very simple. I would say very less code to do that. Very less, very less. Uh, just click on this new button, and you'll be asked for a provider type. And you need to select the open ID connect provider type. The moment you can, um, select open ID connect, it'll ask you more information. You just need to you know, concentrate more on the red boxes because they are mandatory, right? So uh, <coughs> I'll show you something which I've already set. OK. So this is a Google Enterprise uh, provider type. So it, it's very simple. Just given as some name, I just gave Google Enterprise. Uh, the URL suffix automatically comes in, just like your API name automatically pops in when you do a tab, right? Uh, then you have the consumer key and the consumer secret. Now, where do you get the consumer key and secret, right? Now, you need to register an app in Google. So what I've done is, uh, in my enterprise Google apps, I have actually uh, created a particular app, uh, registered a web application app. So once you, once you uh, set this up, you will get a client ID information, which is this, I mean, the whole thing, right? And the client secret. So you just copy paste it out here.
So it matches, right? So I, I am just trying to make sure that I'm not showing something different. Okay, so this is uh, the consumer key that is copy pasted. You need to put in the consumer secret also here. Now what it'll ask you for is the three URLs, right? Now uh, remember what Vika said. It's, it's nothing but the OAuth flow, handshake that happens. So it needs this, um, you know, the authorized endpoint URL and the token endpoint URL. Because we are playing around OpenID Connect, we'll put in a user info endpoint because I need some more details of the users, right? Now, where do you get the URLs from? Just Google it out. Okay, it's freely available in the auth documentations, uh, so it's, it's not, nothing uh, new. Now, in the, now, coming on to the default scope. So here, uh, whenever you play around with the Open ID Connect, make sure that you have the Open ID uh, scope mentioned here. If you don't have the Open ID uh, scope there, it's, it's going to be a normal auth flow. So it's not going to you know, understand that it's, it, it should be an uh, open ID connect communication. Yeah, so it won't return the ID underscore token and um, so forth. Yes. Okay. Now, now comes the piece, registration handler, right? Now, uh, let me just show that new once again. Open ID. And here you can see that Salesforce can automatically create the Apex class for you, the registration handler code for you. So you just need to click that link, automatically create a registration handler template. So that's what I actually did there in the previous auth provider. Okay, and, and uh, once you save that auth provider, you know, whatever you have you know, mentioned out there in all the text boxes, then what you'll see is Salesforce gives you back you know, five sets of URLs. Okay, so the first one is a test-only initialization URL. This, is, this should be basically used by a developer or an admin. Developer in the sense because you do not write much of a code, so even a developer could do this. I mean, uh, the admin could do this. And uh, so basically when the person who is trying to set this auth provider can test if everything is wired properly using the test-only initialization URL. Now when it goes to the production uh, part, you basically use the single sign-on initialization URL, okay? And uh, also you need to make sure that this callback URL is also updated back into the app that you had registered. So here the redirect URL, I had updated back that URL from Salesforce back into this Google. So it needs to understand where to redirect back when you do a uh, no-auth flow, right? Yeah, it's similar to if you look at SAML, you have to exchange certificates and metadata. Here the metadata is your callback URL from um, Salesforce is being put into Google, and Google's consumer key and secret is put into Salesforce. Okay, so I'm a developer, so let me test it out if this works or not. Copy this, go into a new browser, paste, enter. Okay, so it's, it, it is redirecting me to Google, right? So it's saying that, hey, the authorized server is Google, so go there, authenticate yourself. So I'll use my enterprise username and password. And here we have a response. So here we have a response given by the, the, the open ID communication response. So here you have some extra details like the org ID, the ID. ID is the Google plus user ID, you know? with which you link that you know, user with your user record in Salesforce. Then you have the email, you have the provider name, the full name, everything. So maybe I could use this email as, as maybe the email or the ID here to check if the user exists in my org and then let the person in. So let's look how that has to be coded, okay? So this test endpoint is a good way to find out what are the different attributes your OpenID Connect provider is sending before you can make use of it. Okay. So let me just open up the Google Enterprise single sign-on. This is nothing but the Apex class that Salesforce just created out for me. Now here you will see that uh, there is a method called as create user. Now, now this, this particular class implements auth.registration handler and it supports two methods which is create user and the next one is update user. So uh, if it is a new user who is trying to uh, you know, 
come into the org, you know, for the first time, Salesforce knows it needs to hit the create user method. Okay, if an already logged in person is coming back again, it knows it has to hit the update user method, right? So that's how the whole thing works. Now, it's a very simple Apex class, nothing uh, big, big coding out here. You know, what I've tried to do here is I just created one more method called as can create user. You know, I just want to check in my uh, code itself that is, is, is somebody in my enterprise is trying to use the Google credentials and login, or is it somebody using his personal credentials? So maybe I could do that check here, data.email, you know, contains at suyati.com, you know, maybe your, the, the company uh, at uh, company domain name or something like that. So here I'm just making sure that the data.email is not null, just for a demo sake. So here you can code more. That's what I'm trying to say. So when you get a true, what I'm trying to do here is if you find out any user in your org who has the, uh, you know, uh, Google Plus user ID already recorded in it, let him in. You know, return that users of zero. If he is not there, create a user, assign a profile, set the username, email, whatever. You know, all the things that an admin would do to create a user, you just, you know, write the code for that. <clears throat> and here you can link and make sure that the Google ID is also, you know, getting back. So that the next time the person comes in, the update user would fire. And here I can actually take the user who has that particular user ID and make sure to update the user. Now, now this update user method is also useful in a lot of scenarios. Like you can keep your social uh, details in sync with your user records. Now, uh, that when you hit the user info endpoint, you are getting extra details from the user, right, of the user. Now, for example, uh, the user could be changing his secondary email address, you know. So whenever he, you know, annoyingly also, like when he uses login with Google two or three times, what you're trying to do, what this code will try to do is it'll try, try to get the secondary email address. If you write the code, it can get the secondary email address and update that user record. So the details in the social part and the details in your user record is going to be in sync, right? So the analogy to this is in the SAML world, the SAML just-in-time provisioning, uh, the equivalent of it is here, which is every time a user logs in, if you want to capture details and do something with it. Okay. Now, uh, so we configured an auth provider. We, uh, I'll also show you the user. So if I just take you to view fields, you know, I have a Google ID field out here. So this, this is the piece which, with which I'll do the account linking, right? Now, this, uh, the next piece has to be to bring that login button, login with Google button onto your uh, login page. So how do you do that? You need to go to my domain. So if you have set the already set a my, uh, my domain out here, you will be able to get the login page branding, edit this up, and whatever auth providers you have created, it'll come as checkboxes out here, okay? So what I need to do here is just enable this Google Enterprise. Okay, save it. Okay, now I'll try to use this and see how it would look in a production environment. So while Abhishek brings it up, a lot of customers, what they do is, you know, the sales guys, sales people log in into their Gmail the first thing in the morning right, into their Google Apps for business account, and then from there, if they want to go into Salesforce, this is a good way for them to quickly single sign on into their Salesforce accounts. Right, so here we have the, so I have not disabled the standard username and password flow, so you can either use that or Google. So the preferred or the easiest way would be to click this button, right, it takes me there. Put in your enterprise username and password. and the details, the XML comes back into the Apex code. Okay, it comes back into the Apex code. It sees if the user is there. If it is not there, it will do the JIT, the just-in-time provisioning, and it will let you in, right? Looks beautiful, right? Good. Okay. So let's 
pick up some pace as we want to keep oh. some time for oh. Q&A. Oh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> now, the next part is the uh, consumers, you know, consumers using the sales for success community kind of login. So uh, as, as Vikas mentioned, we'll, we'll do the connected apps. So first thing, uh, I'll just go back and deal. Right, implementation steps for single sign-on into the community with any Salesforce org. So three steps, set up an open ID auth provider pointing to the connected app that you have created in an IDP. Because whenever you create an auth provider, it needs in a client ID and a client secret, right? So that client ID and client secret can be generated from a connected app which you create in your main business org, right? So that, that, that's what we need to do. Then coming back to the same, same thing, registration handler. So like a community person could have an associated account linked with it, uh, you know, associated contact record also associated with that. So you could put all those logic into your registration handler piece also. Then finally set the community login page to use the auth provider. Okay. So since Salesforce is, can bo act both as a client and a provider, you can use this for your multi-org single sign-on scenario. Instead of using SAML, you can use OpenID Connect as a mechanism as well. Okay, so this is the uh, connected app that I have created for the OpenID uh, community, the community login. Uh, nothing much, you know, it just creates a consumer key and a consumer secret for me, which I will put in the auth provider. This is an, another auth provider. So here what I've done is just copy paste the U consumer key, the consumer secret, and the authorized endpoint URL token and the user info endpoint URL. Again, you can pick this up from the Salesforce auth, doc auth flow documentations. Again, the default scope would have open ID. Now, how does the registration handler look like? You know, can uh, now create user. Now, how would you create a user? You need to have an account, um, an associated contact, a user associated to the profile, and the same thing, update user would also try to uh, sync back the social details back into the user record. Same thing, you know? Okay, now let me show you how it works. Okay, so this is my community. Okay, so I can have something like login with Salesforce button. You know, I'm a very bad guy in designing things, so I just put a logo out here. <laughs> okay, so uh, you just need to click this, and it takes you to Salesforce, and I'm going to use my success community uh, username and password. Okay. And there we go. So there is no standard, no activation mails, no link, clicking the links. It's automatically provisioned. The, the person just lands in the moment he tries to get into the community. So this is actually driving more productivity for consumers, right? Good. So you can use this technique both for org to org single sign-on, right? If you have multi multiple orgs in your company or community that can accept single that can accept salesforce credentials from anybody right that's what you do in success community that's what you can build your own community with right okay all right all right so i want you to have some key takeaway and uh, here is a playground that we are making you available to play with. So let's look at this one. Yeah. So openidconnect.herokuapp.com. Here, after the session, you can go in and play with it. Basically, you create a connected app in your org and then punch in the client ID and secret. I already have punched in from my demo org. And what you will see here is it's asking me to log in. I'm going to log in via my custom domain, which is 
customer.my.salesforce.com and it's redirecting me to my IDP. I'm going to use my IDP credentials to log in. All right, let's cancel this. Okay. And my admin. All right, so once I have authenticated with my IDP, the IDP takes me to the Salesforce org, and then I have now um, authenticated with my authorization provider. I get this authorization code that is being sent by Salesforce to the client and gives back, uh, Salesforce sends back this access token, as you see on the right side here, as well as the ID token. Now, if I base 64 decode the body of the ID token, I get all these values. Subject is my um, link to the user ID. And here, using the access token, I can get hit the user info endpoint as I'm doing it here, slash services, slash what to, slash user info, and get all the information. What you'll see here is that I'm not only getting this basic attributes, I'm also getting these URLs that I can then go and get additional information. For example, I can hit the uh, feeds URL to get all the feeds of the user that the user has posted or I can hit into um, the profile and get further profile information about the user, right? Um, any custom attributes are available as well. So um, this is how you can, after this call, after this um, um, presentation, go back and play with it and understand it. Okay. So um, key takeaways. OpenID Connect is a moda modern identity protocol similar to SAML, but you don't have to worry about certificates, import, export. You don't, you know, one of the biggest challenges with SAML is that if your IDP certificate expires, and then you have to, as an IT, you have to then make sure that your SPs are notified and those get updated, right? OpenID Connect is a more dynamic than SAML. In SAML, if you have to send attributes, you have to have a static contract. IDP has to send these SAML attributes upfront. In OpenID Connect, it's a dynamic protocol. You can use the user info endpoint and get information as the application needs it. Um, and you can use it both um, as a client and a provider on the Salesforce side. Okay, with that, uh, I would like to open up for questions. Please use the mic over here. Sorry to